Member statements. The member for Trinity Spadina. Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Spadina, Fort York is the epicenter of Ontario's homelessness crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis that was started by the Liberal government when they cut funding for housing, when they left Ontario works rates at $733 a month, or $722 when they actually left it. This government was generous enough to increase it by $10. But it's a humanitarian crisis that exploded. People have been living for years and years in the alleyways of Spadina Fort York. They've been living under the garden. They've been trying to just survive on the streets of Toronto, living on heat, getting heat from heat grates. This government has made it all the worse. They have cut half a billion dollars from an already inadequate housing budget. And during the pandemic, homelessness exploded in my riding. We had people living in tents in, in the parks. And the people of Spadina Fort York, we want people to have housing and people to have supportive housing who have mental health and addictions issues so that they can maintain that housing. But this government has not done that. In fact, last week we just found out that this government is cutting 43 street nurses who serve people without homes in Toronto. And I can speak personally to the impact that this will have. A few months ago, I was supporting, I was providing meals to people experiencing homelessness, and I came across a gentleman who had a badly swollen leg with lesions, and he was refusing to go to the hospital. So we called in a street nurse, and she was able to provide emergency treatment for his leg, and his leg has been saved. But it's that kind of life-saving support and health care that this government is now cutting. So I ask this government, please reverse that decision, bring back those street nurses, and for God's sakes, provide supportive housing so that we can bring an end, an end to this humanitarian crisis of homelessness, not just in Toronto, but across this province. Thank you. Member statements? The member for Whitby. As part of its plan to fix long-term care, the Ontario government, with the leadership of Minister Calandra, will provide up to $673 million this year to long-term care homes to increase staffing levels, leading to more direct care for residents. Speaker, this includes approximately $5 million for long-term care homes in Whitby and approximately $3 million for homes in Oshawa. Now in Whitby, Fairview Lodge will receive $1.8 million, Ben Hill Terrace $1.4 million, and the Village of Taunton Mills $1.1 million. Now, Speaker, this will allow long-term care homes in Whitby to hire and retain more staff so they can provide more care to residents every day. This is part of our government's plan, Speaker, to hire thousands of new staff over the next four years to ensure that these residents living in long-term care get the high-quality care they need and deserve. Thank you, Minister Calandra and his hard-working staff. The member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. This month is World Autism Month, and this past Saturday we celebrated World Autism Day. This is a month where we raise awareness and provide encouragement and support for those living on the autism spectrum. But as we celebrate World Autism Month, there are more than 50,000 children in Ontario who are still on the wait list to receive core services. Or as the Ontario Autism Coalition puts it, there are enough children waiting to receive needs-based therapy to fill the Sky Dome. According to the Financial Accountability Office, depending upon the needs of the child, autism services can cost as much as $95,000 a year. This is far out of reach for most families. Every day these children wait is a day missed in developmental time that they can never get back. Jordan Glass is a friend and advocate who lives in my community. Jordan has two daughters, ages 6 and 13, who have been on the wait list to receive core services since before the pandemic. Jordan told me he wonders if his six-year-old daughter would have been verbal had she been able to receive speech therapy over the past three years. Speaker, every child on the autism spectrum has a unique set of needs and requires a different set of services. More than 50,000 children waiting to receive needs-based autism services in Ontario is not okay. Let's make sure they get the services now. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise in the House today to recognize a very special person in my riding of Carleton, Rihanna Gallagher. Rihanna has been announced as a 4-H ambassador for 2022. 4-H is a non-profit youth development organization that runs 10 provinces uh, in Ontario, in Canada, and 70 countries across the world. 4-H is a volunteer-based organization that brings together youth from ages 6 to 21 from all backgrounds and experience. Youth can find a place to where they can be involved, accepted, valued, and somewhere they can make a difference by developing leadership skills, public speaking, critical thinking, and problem solving. Rihanna has been with 4-H for 11 years, and the journey to becoming an ambassador has been challenging, but no doubt very rewarding. I first met Rihanna, her parents, Alan and Debbie Gallagher, her grandparents, Dwayne and Laura Akers, and her brothers and sisters back in 2016. And I also, in fact, recently ran into her brother, Colin, who's also keeping agriculture alive and well in Carleton. Like many of the numerous farming families in Carleton, the next generation of the Akers and Gallaghers are keeping farming and agriculture alive and thriving in Ottawa and Ontario, because farmers feed families and our Ontario government will continue to support agriculture in this province. Thank you. Member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Speaker, this morning I stood in the rain with advocates, young and old, from across the province rallying to save farmland, which is under threat from this government. Thousands of Hamiltonians from every riding participated in the largest consultation in Hamilton, which overwhelmingly showed our community wanted to save, not pave, farmland. And yet the Minister of Municipal uh, Housing and Municipal Affairs just last week threatened to take municipalities to the Ontario Land Tribunal for listening to the public. This government has shown that they are prepared to strong-arm the people of the province to get their way. But it's not just Hamilton that this government is ignoring. The Stop Sprawl movement is spreading, with campaigns engaging thousands of Ontarians in Halton, Peel, Simcoe, Aurelia, Oxford, and many more communities across the province. This movement has support from planners and farmer and agricultural organizations across the province. Speaker, as an MPP, my biggest priority is working with my community. It's clear that this government doesn't share the value of working with, not against, the people of Ontario. While Ontarians are building a brighter vision for how our cities grow, this government is doubling down with big highways and big houses that no one can afford. It's time for this government to look out for the people of the province, not just their wealthy, well-connected land speculators and donors looking to profit from destroying our farmland. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Perth Wellington. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, March 17, 2011 was one of the darkest days in memory. That's when, the fire, that's when fire took the lives of Deputy District Chief Ken Ray and Firefighter Ray Waller. Investigations followed, and they revealed what firefighters could not have known. Behind some insulation, the fire was quickly degrading the lightweight wooden roof trusses. Collapse was inevitable. Questions turned to what could have been done to prevent future tragedies like this. The answer was soon apparent. We need to identify buildings with trust and lightweight construction systems. In 2017, I first introduced the Ray and Waller Act. Twice it received all party support. It took some time, but this year I was in Listowel to announce the province is taking action. First, the building code is changing to require chief building officials to notify local fire departments when new buildings other than houses will have lightweight construction systems. Second, to address existing buildings, the fire marshal is now requiring municipalities to document buildings with lightweight construction in their community risk assessments and to use that information to keep firefighters safe. And finally, the province is asking that lightweight construction identification be harmonized in building codes across Canada. Together, these changes capture the intent of the Ray Waller Act. The goal is the same, to give firefighters more information, to reduce the risk and to save lives. I want to thank everyone who contributed to these changes. I especially want to thank North Perth Fire Chief Janie Pate, former Chief Ed Smith, and all the chiefs in Perth Wellington who helped us along the way. And most importantly, the families of Ken Ray and Ray Walter. By advocating for the Ray and Walter Act and then supporting these changes, they turned unimaginable grief into constructive action. Thank you, Speaker. 
Thank you. Next, we have the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. The opioid crisis is an important issue in my riding of Hamilton Mountain and across the province. Last year, there were 2,426 opioid-related deaths, and in the vast majority of these cases, people were alone when they passed away. In Hamilton, the opioid-related death rate has been roughly 28 per cent higher than the provincial rate over the last several years. As of September 2021, 115 people died in Hamilton alone as a result of the opioid overdose. These are Hamiltonians who are mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, friends, and family members. So far in 2022, Hamilton Paramedic Services have responded to 147 incidences related to sus suspected opioid overdose. We cannot allow this to continue. The number of opioid-related deaths have risen dramatically over the past decade in Ontario, and the pandemic has made things worse. The precautions to prevent the spread of COVID have led to the reduced access to services for people who use drugs and causing fatal overdoses to rise. The wait time is 100 days on average for an adult residential treatment program for substance abuse, and yet hospitalizations for substance abuse-related illnesses outnumber those for heart attacks. Speaker, this is a crisis, and it's time for this Premier to step up and declare an opioid, the opioid problem as a public health emergency. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. Since elected two years ago, I've been meeting with advocacy groups on autism, with experts, and with families that are struggling to obtain therapy for their children. The ratio for children with autism in the province of Ontario is 1 for 66. That means that the need for diagnosis and treatment is important and should be given the attention it deserves to address those needs. The number of children waiting for autism support has now grown to 53,000 children in Ontario. So clearly, what this government has been doing is not bringing the relief that was promised. The cuts in critical services and reduction of coverage that families can receive is harmful. But it doesn't have to be this way, Mr. Speaker. If you were to listen to these advocacy groups, these experts, and these families, you would understand where the solutions are. Like a needs-based Ontario autism program for every child that doesn't discriminate based on age, including applied behavioral analysis, occupational therapy, mental health, and speech and language pathology. Like reducing wait times by hiring 5,000 more special education workers. Like implementing a direct billing option for autism therapy. Like conducting a comprehensive reform of special education and better transition people into adult services. And that's what Ontario Liberals are proposing to do because we have been listening. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, beginning in the 1700s, the Scottish Highland Clarences displaced many Scots as they were forced from their homes and only to watch them burn to the ground. With no means to support their families, many looked to Canada for a new life, settling in various locations across Upper Canada and joining many of their fellow countrymen as they fought for the Crown during the American Civil War, or, uh, War of Independence. Sorry. Today, there is more Canadians of Scottish descent than any other. My ancestors arrived in the ship Macdonald in 1786, joining countrymen in Glengarry, Ontario. Once they established their homes and livelihoods, they immediately set about building schools, educating their children, and helping to establish institutions necessary to build a strong and secure country. The first post-secondary institution in Upper Canada was established at St. Raffles in Glengarry, South Glengarry Township. Across the province, Highland Games attract thousands of people enjoying the Scottish culture. And our Minister of Tourism and Culture, Lisa McLeod, has joined me several times at the Glengarry Highland Games, the North American Fightsland Championships. On June 3rd of last year, my private member's bill received royal assent designating St. Andrew's Day, Scotland's official national day, celebrated on November 30th each year as Scottish Heritage Day in yeah, Ontario. Yeah. Speaker, also this week, millions of people across North America will celebrate Tartan Day, held annually on April the 6th. 
The day originated in Nova Scotia in the mid-1980s and has grown more popular each year, being adopted by displaced Scots across the globe. The speaker, Lang Meyerik, roughly translated means, may you live long and keep well. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. That concludes our members' statements for this morning. Introductions.